The Emperor's Silent Army, Terracotta Warriors of Ancient China by Jenny O'Connor Essential question, how can people use clues to learn about ancient cultures? A Discovery, Linton County, People's Republic of China, March 1974 It is just an ordinary day in early spring, or so three farmers think as they trudge across a field in northern China. They are looking for a good place to dig a well. There has been a drought and they must find water or risk losing their crops later in the year. The farmers choose a spot near a grove of persimmon trees. Down they dig 5 feet, 10 feet, still no water. They decide to keep on digging a little deeper. All of a sudden, one of the farmers feels his shoulder strike against something hard. Is it a rock? It's difficult to see at the bottom of a dark hole. So the farmer kneels down for a closer look. No, it isn't a rock. It seems to be clay and not raw clay, but clay that has been baked and made into something. But what? Now, more carefully, the men dig around the something. Perhaps it is a pot or a vase. However, what slowly reveals itself is the pottery head of a man who stares back at them open-eyed and amazingly real looking. The farmers have never seen anything like it before, but they do remember stories that some of the old people in their village have told. Stories of a pottery man found many years ago not far from where they are now. The villagers had been scared that the pottery man would bring bad luck. So they broke it to bits, which were then reburied and forgotten. The terracotta figures were discovered in the countryside of northern China. Analyze the text. Figurative language. Find an example of hyperbole on page 495. Why would the author use this type of figurative language here? What does it mean? The terracotta army was discovered when well diggers found the head of a pottery man like this one. No photographs were taken that day. The three well diggers are not so superstitious. They report their discovery to a local official. Soon a group of archaeologists arrives to search the area more closely. Maybe they will find pieces of a clay body to go with the clay head. In fact, they find much more. During the weeks and months that follow, the archaeologists dig out more pottery men, which now are called by a more dignified term, terracotta figurines. The figurines are soldiers. That much is clear, but they come from a time long ago when Chinese warriors wore knee-length robes, armor made from a small iron fish scales and elaborate top-knot hurdles. All of the soldiers are life-size or a little bigger and weigh as much as 400 pounds. They stand at attention as if waiting for the command to charge into battle. The only thing missing is their weapons, and those are found too. Hundreds of real bronze swords, daggers, and battle axes, as well as thousands of scattered arrowheads, all so perfectly made that after cleaning their ancient tips are still sharp enough to split a hair. Today, after nearly 30 years of work, terracotta soldiers are still being uncovered and restored. 
what the well diggers stumbled upon, purely by accident, has turned out to be among the largest and most incredible archaeological discovery of modern times. Along with the great pyramids in Egypt, the buried army is now considered one of the true wonders of the ancient world. Spread out over several acres near the city of Xi'an, the soldiers number not in the tens or hundreds, but in thousands, probably 7,500 total. Until 1974, nobody knew that right below the people of northern China, an enormous underground army had been standing guard, silently and watchfully for more than 2,200 years. Who put them there? One man, known as the fierce tiger of Qin, the divine son of heaven. He was the first emperor of China. Although more than 7,000 strong, the Terracotta army is small compared to the Emperor's real army. Qin for Immortality Before the time of Qin, Qin Shi Huang, who lived from 259 to 210 BCE, there was no China. Instead, there were seven separate kingdoms each with its own language, currency, and ruler. For hundreds of years, they had been fighting one another. The kingdom of Qin was the fiercest. Soldiers received their pay only after they had presented their generals with the cut-off heads of enemy warriors. By 221 BCE, the ruler of the Qin kingdom had eaten up his neighbors like a silkworm devouring a leaf. According to an ancient historian, the name China comes from Qin. The king of Qin now ruled over an immense empire, around one million square miles that stretched north and west to the Gobi Desert, south to present-day Vietnam and east to the Yellow Sea. To the people of the time, this was the entire civilized world. Not for another hundred years would the Chinese know that empires existed beyond their boundaries. To the ruler of Qin, being called king was not longer grand enough. He wanted a title that no one else had ever had before. What he chose was Qin, Qin Shi Huang. This means first in peril, God in heaven, and Almighty of the universe, all rolled into one. No paintings exist of the imperial dawn in his lifetime, so there is no way to know how faithful this portrait is. But no title, however superhuman it sounded, could protect him from what he fears most, dying. More than anything, the emperor wanted to live forever. According to legend, a magic elixir had granted eternal life to the people of the mythical eastern islands. Over the years, the emperor sent expeditions out to sea in search of the islands and the magic potion, but each time they came back empty-handed. If he couldn't live forever, then Qin, Qin Shi Huang was determined to live as long as possible. He ate powder jade and drank mercury in the belief that they would prolong his life. In fact, these medicines were poison and may have caused Imperial to fall sick and die while on a tour of the easternmost outposts of his empire. He was 49 years old. If word of 
Chin Chin Shrek Death got out while he was away from the capital, there might be a revolt, so his ministers kept the news as a secret. With the imperial's body inside his chariot, the entire party traveled back to the capital city. Mules were brought into the imperial's chariot. Daily reports on affairs were delivered as usual all to keep up the appearance that the emperor was alive and well. However, it was summer, and a terrible smell began to come from the chariot. But the clever ministers found a way to account for the stain. A cart was loaded with smelly, salted fish and made to precede the chariot overpowering and masking any full orders coming from the dead emperor. And so, Chin Chinshuareg returned to the capital for burial. The tomb of Chin Chinshuareg had been under construction for more than 30 years. It was begun when he was a young boy of 13 and it was still not finished when he died. Even incomplete, the emperor's tomb was enormous, larger than his largest palace. According to the legend, it had a doomed ceiling inlaid with clusters of pearls to represent the sun, moon, and stars. Below was a gigant relief map of the world made from bronze. Bronze hills and mountains rose up from the floor, with rivers of mercury flowing into a mercury sea. Along the banks of the rivers were models of the Imperial's palace and cities, all exact replicas of the real ones. This detail of silk robe shows an embroidered dragon, the symbol of Chinese emperors. In ancient times, the Chinese believed that life after death was not so very different from the life on earth. The soul of the dead person could continue to enjoy all the pleasures of everyday life. So people who were rich enough constructed elaborate underground tombs filled with silk robes, jewelry with precious stones, furniture, games, boats, chariots, everything the dead person could possibly need or want. Chin Chin Shorang knew that grave robbers would try their best to loot the treasures in the tomb. So he had machines put inside the tomb that produced the rumble of thunder to scare off intruders. A mechanical crossbows at the entrance were set to fire arrows automatically should anyone dare to trespass. The emperor also made certain that the workers who carried his coffin to its final resting place never revealed its exact whereabouts. As the men worked their way back through the tunnels to the tomb's entrance, a stone door came crashing down and they were left to die, sealed inside the tomb along with the body of the emperor. Ancient Chin. About 2,000 soldiers have been unearthed yet. Amazingly, so far, no two are the same. The army includes men of all different ages, from different parts of China, with different temperaments. A young soldier looks both excited and nervous. An older officer, perhaps a veteran of many wars, appears tired, resigned. Some soldiers seem lost in thought, possibly dreaming of their return home. Others look proud and confident. Although from a distance the figures appear almost identical, like a giant-sized toy soldiers, it is a distinct work of art. Did real-life models pose for the figures? Probably not, but hundreds of craftsmen from all over the empire spent more than 10 years in workshops set up near the pits 
creating the warriors. It is likely that they made the faces of the soldiers look like the faces of people that they knew from home. The uniforms of the terracotta figures are exact copies in clay of what real soldiers of the day were. The soldier's uniform tells his rank in the army. The lowest ranking soldiers are bareheaded and wear heavy knee-length tunics, but no armor. Often their legs are wrapped in cloth, shin guards for protection. Analyze the text. Text structure. How does the author organize information on this page? How does this section of the text fit in the overall text structure? The general's uniform are the most elegant. Their caps sometimes sport a pheasant feather. Their fancy shoes curl up at the toes and their fine armor is made from small iron fish scales. Tassels on their armor are also a mark of their high rank. The terracotta soldiers are now the ghostly grayish color of baked clay, clay that came from nearby Mount Lee. Originally, the soldiers are all brightly colored. Tiny bits of paint can still be seen of many of the figures and are proof that uniforms came in a blaze of colors, purple, blue, green, yellow, red, and orange. The colors of each soldier's uniform indicated not only which part of the army he belonged to, cavalry or infantry, for example, but also what his particular rank was. The terracotta horses were fully painted too, in brown with pink ears, nostrils, and mouths. Unfortunately, when figures are dug out of the ground, most of the paint of them peels off and sticks to the surround earth. Also, when exposed to air, the paint tends to crumble into dust. The colored computer image shows how the general would have looked originally. Today, groups of artisans and workshops near the three pits make replicas of the soldiers following the techniques used 2,200 years ago. Their work helps archaeologists learn more about how the original figures were created. Even though the workers today have the advantage of modern kilns that register temperatures exactly, no copies have ever come out as hard or as lustrous as the ancient originals. The workers of today are also not under the same kind of pressure as the emperor's potters. If they made a mistake, they were killed. Who were the potters who made the original soldiers? For the most part, they have remained anonymous. In ancient times, being a craftsman was considered lowly work. However, some soldiers are signed, probably by the master porter in charge of a workshop. The signature is like a stamp of approval, a sign of quality control. Of course, the creators of the terracotta Warriors never intended their work to be seen by anyone other than the emperor. That is a strange notion of 21st century minds to accept. Artists today want their work to be seen, enjoyed, admired. But as soon as the emperor's army was completed, it was buried. Pits were dug 20 feet deep, green tiled floor were laid down. Dirt walls were constructed, creating tunnels in which the soldiers and horses and chariots were placed. 
A wooden roof was built overhead, and then ten feet of dirt was shoveled on top of the army. It was supposed to remain undisturbed for all eternity, but it did not turn out that way. How surprised the tin sculptors would be by the crowns of people from all over the world who come to see their creations. This cross-section drawing shows how soldiers in Pit 1 were placed in underground tunnels, which were separated by earthen walls and covered by a wooden roof. Analyze the text. Fact and opinion. What claims does the author make on pages 502-503? Which claims are supported by facts and evidence? Which claims are not supported by evidence? Imperial Tone. What exactly is the Terracotta army guarding so steadfastly? What besides the body of the head in peril is inside the tomb? The answer is that nobody knows, and the government of China has no plans to excavate and find out. In ancient China, it was the custom to build a natural-looking hill on top of a person's tomb. The more important a person was, the bigger the hill. Thousands of years of harsh weather have worn down the emperor's mound. Originally, it was 400 feet high, almost as high as the biggest of the three great pyramids in Egypt. Like the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Chinese believes that the body of a dead person should be preserved as a home for the soul. However, the Chinese did not make a person's body into a mummy. They believed that Jade had magic powers, among them the ability to keep a dead body from decaying. In Chinese tombs from the 4th century BCE, bodies of noblemen and princes have been found wearing entire suits of jade. It is believed that Qin Qin Shuren is buried in just such a suit. The thousands of small tiles, all beautifully carved and sewn together with gold threads and over this jade burial outfit. His body is supposedly covered in a blanket of pearls. For all the things placed within peril, certainly they must be grand beyond imagining. Silk robes embroidered with dragons, gem-encrusted crowns and jewelry, music instruments, hand-carved furniture, lamps, beautiful dishes, cooking pots, and golden utensils. Like the pharaohs of ancient Egypt, the first emperor would have made certain that he had everything he might possibly want in the afterlife. But unless his tomb is excavated, what these treasures look like will remain a mystery. The body of the emperor, which has never been recovered, may wear a jade funeral suit like this one found in the tomb of Chinese princess from the late 2nd century.